So my name is Zita Henderson. I'm a member of the Socialist Alliance Geelong branch. Uh, and I'm going to be chairing this session, which is titled Strike Back, Organising Workers in Unorganised um, Industries. Um, Green Left and Socialist Alliance are the hosts of this conference. And if you are interested in becoming a socialist activist, please... Um, uh, go come along and join us, um, either in this um, uh, space of um, Perth or wherever you have come from across the country, we're everywhere, as you will find out. Um, please talk to one of us about joining us or becoming active um, with all the campaigns that we're currently running around the country. I'd like to begin this session by acknowledging that we are meeting on, uh, uh, and I cannot pronounce this, I'm sorry, um, Woodruck, thank you, and N Noongar um, country. This place was never ceded, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Okay. So we have three speakers with us um, this morning. Unfortunately, Judy um, Sarek, who was also meant to speak um, today, um, has now got COVID, so she won't be with us. Okay. So our three speakers, first of all, we have Dana, who is from um, the um, Malaysian Socialist Party, or uh, the PSG. <laughs> and then we have Peter, Yay, is it? Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, who is from um, the Singapore um, Delivery Drivers um, Organisation who have been trying to get improved conditions and um, in improved pay for workers delivering food around Singapore. <laughs> and then we have Cody, who's um, from Perth, from this area. And um, he is involved in um, mainly railway um, uh, workers um, across um, the Pilbara and the Nullarbor. And uh, Cody will be talking to us about those workers in that industry as well. Okay. So after the three speakers, we'll um, open it up to discussion. So we'll begin with Dana. Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, how are you all today? <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm Dana from Socialist Party of Malaysia. Uh, so uh, firstly, I would like uh, I will uh, thank uh, the organizing team to invite us to share about our works and how how we are organizing work in Malaysia. So um, then maybe we can start the slide. So I'm given this topic uh, to share about our work. So firstly, I will uh, just share about the background of uh, the working situation in Malaysia. So this is our total Malaysian population. Malaysia's population is uh, 33.94 million. So in that, uh, we have workforce around 16 million. So it's around 47%. It's around, it's, it's nearly 50, uh, 50%. Okay, next. Okay, so here we can see the general overview of working class in Malaysia. So we have uh, industry. It's uh, until 2020. So we can see the highest percentage is in service. Okay, so it's around 63%. Okay, next. Okay, so here uh, it's, uh, uh, I put in a pie chart because we can understand more. So service is around 64% and agriculture we have 11%. Other than that, uh, manufacturing is 16. And here we can see the total workforce is 60 million. The civil, civil servant is around 1.2 million. Okay. So other than that, all is private sector. Uh, next. 
okay so we have a new uh, new sector now is a is a growing it's a gig workers so until last year we have around 3 million gig workers in malaysia okay next okay another one is uh, we have uh, migrant workers uh, so uh, what i get is uh, we have around 5.5 million migrant workers with 2.2 million documented and they are more in manufacturing agriculture and services and also domestic work uh, workers and migrant workers is allowed to join union uh, under employment act but they are denied to join under immigration laws okay uh, so it's a, it's a contradict and also we have uh, refugees uh, it's around one one eight nine uh, millions and it's include five fifty two uh, fifty two thousand and uh, they are not allowed to work legally okay so we have an article from ideas the institute of, for democracy and economic affairs so if they give a legal right to work they can contribute over 3 billion for gdp okay next okay now the latest uh, phenomena happen in malaysia is a fixed term contract fixed fixed term contract so uh, it's begin in 1990s by mahade so he he want to privatize everything so before <laughs> So it's mostly affect the cleaners and security guard. In in uh, actually he touch first in government buildings, like uh, hospitals, uh, hospital schools. So before that, cleaners and security guard is a civil servant. So they got a lot of benefits, as the civil servant currently they are receiving. But in 1990s when he privatized this thing. So they become private workers, and fixed term contract is uh, just a, a short like um, in Malaysia the uh, maximum uh, year of contract is three years only. After that, they need to sign another new contract. So that is a fixed term contract. Uh, now in two thousand sixteen, it started with civil servants, severing to government sector. So they are touched with doctors and teachers. So they are the new doctors who finish the studies, they will take as a contract workers first. After this, it depends to the hospital management to, to pursue or to continue, it depends on them. And uh, uh, for now, it's around 60 to 70 percent contract workers in Malaysia. Okay. Next. Okay, now we are going to unionized worker. So, how many unionized worker in Malaysia? Okay, so just now we see around. Uh, uh, we have, uh, I think we have around fifteen million something. Uh, so only we have five point eight percent is unionized. It's a very less. Uh, and in that five point eight percent only covered two percent by ca okay so we can see the graph here uh, so the the number of workers is uh, going up uh, means the number of unionized workers is going up and uh, no no i mean the work workforce is going up but the unionized is going down okay okay next okay why why in Malaysia we cannot unionize the worker? So first of all is union busting. So uh, uh, normally uh, the workers who, who are unionized, they cannot do whatever they want. They got pressure from manage, uh, means from the employer. So the employees, uh, of course the employees don't like uni union, of course. So they are trying to break the union by they are like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, attacking the leaders so they are like giving pressure to them uh, and also bureaucracy 
So we have uh, a lot of things we need to do for the f formation of union. We need to go level by level. So we have uh, uh, a lot of challenges to form an, an union. And so and also it's a, it uh, involves a lot of documentation. So the worker need to do a lot of documentation thing because the workers uh, is mostly from just just now we said it's a cleaner security guards. It's a, normally they are not very well educated. So the documentation things is uh, like uh, they need to need someone to more educated people to do that. But it re restricted them to to do all the documentation thing. Okay, so like they are, they are at, at last they will like fed up. A lot of things we need to do. Okay, and also uh, the weak enforcement of trade union law and labor law. Uh, just now we uh, recently we have one case uh, a worker work in a, a U.S. embassy, so he work as a security guard, but. Uh, uh, when we uh, file a case, the work uh, the worker lost, and our party is handling that case. So it's a very long struggle. But finally, they say the embassy has the humanity and protected of uh, like uh, they cannot bring it, so they cannot challenge the U.S. embassy. So that is <laughs> the weak at enforcement and. Uh, like uh, the union leadership also uh, not very progressive, uh, means more to employer side. They are not trying to fight for workers. Like uh, they want a position, they want a like uh, uh, they want a, a good position and then uh, uh, well known. But they never helping the workers to fight their rights and everything. The leadership, I mean the leadership, and also. Uh, the existing union also they don't want to organize migrant workers, so they don't want to let them join the union. So this is all challenges that we cannot form the union in Malaysia. Okay, next. Okay, actually we have a uh, two trade uh, federation uh, means uh, uh, the Malaysian government recognize. So we have a big uh, union, uh, federation union. First is MTUC, Malaysian Trade Unions Congress. And the second is a uni MLC. Okay. So <laughs> frankly to say, MTUC is not, uh, uh, it's not for workers. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, more like a yellow union. Yellow union means it's not a... Uh, uh, it's more to employer, more to uh, that side. It's not uh, for workers. Even the workers want to file, uh, to, uh, they want to get their service, they need to pay the registration fees around, I think, 100 to, 100 to 150 ringgit first. And every level they have to pay, the worker. The consultation fees, then uh, when file the case in labor office they need to pay the transport they need to pay so the the workers they don't have any uh, channel to bring their claims or case and second is uni mlc okay actually we have a good relationship with uni mlc uh, means uh, our party so uh, uh, we can represent workers by their uh, letters they give our authorization let letters for us to represent the worker. So we have a good relationship with Union MLC. Uh, okay, next. Okay. So how PSM reached unorganized workers? Okay, so we have, uh, actually for us to, uh, just now when I uh, told about the challenge, we have uh, a lot of challenge to, to organize pe uh, workers through union. So we have uh, other uh, methods to reach out the workers. So first is uh, we have uh, one uh, network uh, for government contract workers, JPKK. Uh, and then we have a helpline 
siap, siap, like helpline is a hotline. We have a phone, hotline phone, phone number. So the workers can contact us. Okay. And then we have a hospital union. Uh, and then we are like uh, using online meetings like Zoom, everything after COVID. Uh, like we are continuously using that, that method. Because we have uh, some challenges to organize workers to have a physical meeting. Because uh, they are working environment. Like a security guard, they are work for 12 hours. So we cannot ask them to join meeting physically. So we are using these uh, online meetings to organize them more. And um, so we are forming workers committee and uh, also the WhatsApp group. So we are now using this kind of uh, way, technology, so to organize worker. Okay, actually uh, JPKK, uh, that is a network of government contract workers. In Malay, we say jaringan pekerja contract keraja. Jaringan pekerja contract kerajaan. Okay, so JPKK. Actually, oh, okay. So, <laughs> so under PSM, we have this network. So all these contract workers, we will put under JPKK. Okay, so it's very easy to organize them. So it's a, like a Marhen, Marhen groups. It's a grassroots people's group. Okay, next. Okay, so this is JPKK works. So they will go to hospitals, they will meet the cleaners. Uh, we will uh, promote our uh, network. So we, we are meet people. Next. So this is hospital. Uh, this is our members. Okay, next. Okay, this is, uh, we try, sometimes we are try to, uh, trying to meet workers physically. So this is uh, the physical meetings. Okay, uh, they are, I think they are cleaners, uh, cleaners, uh, security, and these cleaners. Okay. Okay, this is uh, online, so we are we are doing online meetings with them. Okay. Okay, so uh, we also give uh, some trainings for contact workers. So uh, uh, the contacts we we get, we will trying to do training for them. Uh, this is uh, like uh, okay. Actually, security guard all they are the the, the employer they are misuse uh, means uh, they are working hours, so they will get more means the profit. So the workers will get less. The calculation they are using is very wrong, but the workers don't know how to calculate their wage. So we will give the training how to calculate their wage. So for example. Uh, the allocation for one security guard, the government give to them is uh, around 3,000 ringgit. But what they get is around 2,000 only. Sometimes 1,800. So the, the rest, the balance, the contractors will get. <laughs> okay. So the, uh, the workers, they don't know how to calculate it. You know, the, they have formulas, the, what, the overtime for one hour, how much, they have rate, the formulas. They don't know how to calculate. So we are giving this training to, to have a more uh, view about their salary. Okay. Uh, okay. So we also give uh, this kind of training for them. Uh, we have uh, Undang Undang Buro is labor law. So what labor law they must know. Uh, how uh, how many hours they want to work per week? So the law is uh, related to their job and everything. So uh, this one is a constructive dismissal. Uh, what will what will uh, make you as uh, for CD? So this all we will doing now the training. Okay, next. Okay. Uh, so, okay, actually that one, uh, the Occupied Health Ministry, so we have four security uh, guard. They were dismissed uh, after they uh, filed a case in labor office. After they uh, filed a claim in labor office, they were, they were dismissed. So, uh, so we are taking them to, uh, to health ministry office. Okay, 
health ministry uh, depart, uh, ministry office and we occupied there until the minister uh, ministry minister people all come and we we, we solve the issue so they were take, taken back for work okay uh, and also the progressive wage okay now malaysia is trying to implement progressive wage so progressive wage is um, some more like a skill they are they are like uh, want to use skill and send the worker for trainings and they will review their salary so it's uh, like contradict with basic minimum so we don't know they will touch the basic minimum or not so but we are against it you must rem uh, you cannot touch the basic minimum and this progressive wage also ha have a lot uh, something wrong so so it's more to employer it's a benefit employer actually okay uh, so uh, all this is uh, we are doing uh, hapuskan system contract means uh, abolish contract system so we don't want contract system so this is all meetings we are did in the so human resource minister so we are giving a memorandum and everything uh, okay that one is uh, the the top one okay our our basic wage now is a uh, 1500 per month still we have workers who are receiving 1200 it, it it was implemented in 2022 but now to 2024 still we have 1200 receiving workers so we bring that one to human resource minister okay next i am not there okay so this one is labor office we are bring workers to labor office to file a claim case and everything okay next okay so this is the the what the helpline the whole line actually this one i'm handling so i will receive a calls message from workers asking the what's uh, like uh, what what can be done uh, if they got any issue they will ask us advice so it's uh, more more like that actually we are we are using this to organize worker actually when we receive complaint i will give advice and i will forward this worker to our branch so the branch members they will handle that worker they will ask that worker come to the office and they will keep in touch with that workers so we will keep that workers so this is the way of organizing work is uh, being done in uh, psm okay so they will handle everything okay next okay this is uh, the, our hospital our, our hospital union okay next all these are cleaners okay all the, uh, the hospital cleaners so we did some programs with them training okay i think some comrades know saras comrade saras from psm uh, she is the handling this union okay okay this is the union's program okay next okay actually they did a motorbike campaign from pinang to putrajaya so it take 4 days all our ladies the rider okay all eh, sorry ah uh, all our ladies so they reach the the arif putrajaya and then they, they, that is uh, in front of uh, our hospital ministry uh, means health ministry that one so they gave a memorandum to uh, that time health minister kairi jamaluddin okay so uh, they send the memorandum so they just uh, take four days okay this is a uh, like a creative idea i think saras saras did okay then next okay all this is a uh, uh, the union's uh, case they are filing in human resource regarding the ca so collective agreement so they have some issues in collective agreement so they are filing uh, for union and there's a movie for them actually we have a movie maybe i can <laughs> i can share the 
the link. So uh, it's about the cleaners, how, what's their issue in, in hospital and everything. Okay, next. Okay, this is all online meetings that ju ju just now I, I told. And then next. Okay, so we, we, we also, PSM also, we, uh, we as a member in R2R, the rights, right to redress coalition for migrant workers. So we are trying to, uh, we are trying to mobilize mi migrant workers as well. So we are joining this uh, right to redress coalition. Okay, and then next. Oh, that's okay. So uh, final finish. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, the way we are working. PSM is working, so we have uh, 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 some methods uh, like. Uh, okay, of course we cannot form union uh, directly because we have a lot of research uh, challenges. So we are using this kind of uh, new methods. So I think it's uh, going well now. Uh, but the thing is, uh, the situation in Malaysia is. Uh, uh, the uh, means the fear, the fear is still there, and also the security, job security. Because in contract system, uh, we have a three years, uh, uh, we have three years contract, if, and then after that they need to renew again. So if they, let's say they are like a joint union or anything, they will lose their job. So they don't want to lose their job; they just make it secu secure, so they don't want to join any union. So this is the environment. <laughs> so this is make uh, them to join the union. So that's why we are uh, using the network, network thing, and uh, the CIAP helpline to organize more worker. So I think we can organize more. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. That was great. Um, next up, we have Peter, who's going to talk to us about the delivery drivers who he's helping to organise in regards to their safety and wages in Singapore. Thank you, Peter. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sometimes you may see that I'm not standing uh, stably because I actually injured my back while doing deliveries. And I'm using my mobile phone because my speech is there, but sometimes I may not be able to maintain the eye contract. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to this uh, Echo Socialism conference. My name is Peter Yo. I'm honored to share my experience and our collective struggle to create a fairer and more just society. I'm a 52-year food delivery rider and one of the leaders of SG Riders, a network of fellow food delivery riders in Singapore fighting for better work conditions. Since food delivery platforms emerged in Singapore in 2016, I've been on the front lines navigating the streets to ensure people receive their meals on time. But my journey is about more than just delivering food. It's about delivering change. The e gig economy has transformed how we work, but it has also exposed significant gaps in workers' protection, safety and fair wages. In 2019, something interesting happened. On the 5th of November, the government suddenly uh, banned the use of uh, e-scooters on the road. This angered many food delivery riders who relied on it to make their deliveries. What followed was about a week-long resistance by riders confronting the government to reverse the ban. Although they did not reverse the ban, there were hundreds of riders who rose up and uh, found a creative way to make themselves heard. Uh, strikes and public assemblies are practically criminalized in Singapore. So instead, the riders went to the relevant uh, ministers meet the people section in a group and confronted them. These sessions are usually done one to one. But the riders did it in a group and effectively turned it into a town hall. The media coverage very thoroughly. Sorry. 
making the public aware of our riders' struggle. The riders earned some uh, concessions. The minister who introduced the ban lost his seat, but they did not manage to reverse the ban. But since then, the government started to take riders' view seriously, and several policies reforms took place. The 2019 resistance was inspiring. It showed that riders have potential. However, the energy from that fizzled out when the ban was not reversed. It was not until three years later in 2022 that we riders started an organization with a wider version. A small group of uh, us like minus riders established the SG Riders. This island-wide network of uh, food delivery riders have grown into a considerable force dedicated to improving safety, wages, and bargaining power. Our mission is to ensure that every rider can work with dignity, earn a fair wage, and have a voice in the policies that affect our life. In 2023, I was approached by uh, Workers Make Possible, a group fighting for fair and safe working conditions for workers, regardless of their gender, race, and nationality, to speak on the issues riders face on at the May Day Rally 2023 at Hongin Park. This was the, was the first Labor Day in Singapore after many decades. 300 attended the rally. This opportunity underscored the critical need for public awareness and collective action to address the pressing issues within our industry. Currently, the National Delivery Champion Association is the only association representing food delivery riders recognized by the government and the platforms. However, it has strong government links. This is the norm for, all, for almost all units in Singapore. The NDCA cannot conduct collective bargaining for riders until the platform workers bill is passed in parliament. However, it is difficult to register an independent union. Many riders have uh, criticized, criticized the NDCA, dubbing it the $9 Collection Association because they collected the fees from the riders without effectively analyzing or helping its riders. Giving these constraints and opportunities, how do we build our network in SG riders? We started by only having an Instagram page Riders were primarily in their neighborhood webs or telegram groups, but there was no official channel claiming to represent riders' issue besides the NDCA. Yet at the same time, it was not easy for any rider to get themselves heard on the NDCA channel. Our Instagram page therefore showcased riders' voices. We shared their screenshot of uh, low fares, their problems with parking, long waiting time, and unsafe load, for example. It was also great to have partners like Workers Make Possible and independent media sites with a bigger platform to help us grow our, our base. We tried to talk to the riders about how they deserve better policies by the government to protect them, but this approach was not very effective. Most riders in Singapore, like many workers, don't think it is possible to influence the government. Even though the 2019 resistance actually shook the government, we soon realized that we needed to meet riders where they are at and work from there. We started organizing small shows, get together for riders to just relax and chill out. We ate durian together, we celebrated Chinese New Year, and gradually riders began to trust us and join in the network. In every of this section, we will spend at least a few minutes talking about class struggle. We also talk more about our victories, even though they were small. Our social media reach is not too bad. We have more followers than the NDC on Instagram, and we are friends with groups that will distribute our news far and wide. Through spreading riders' story, we are proud to say that we play a part in one of the major platforms, introducing a better, safe road policy and we pressurize a merchant to remove some discriminatory signs against riders 
when other riders learn about our victories, they know that we are capable of getting things done. Another important way we bring more riders into the movement is by also paying to more local issues that are easier to solve. Riders are more likely to believe that we can come together and solve parking issues or get a building to let us use their passenger lift instead of their cargo lift. This may seem small, but they make a big difference to the riders. That being said, I would like to talk about some of the structural issues riders face. To challenge this condition, we will re require much more worker power than we currently have and we are working towards that. Overall, instead of framing the issue as about fairness or justice, we thought it would be effective to think about them as issue of safety. One critical issue that makes all riders unsafe is the incentive system imposed by the platform. The platforms always tie the incentive payout to online hours, acceptance and cancellation rates. This practice is a similar to modern slavery, forcing riders to work under immense pressure without adequate rest. For instance, riders are not allowed break during hours better conditions because their earnings are tied to this intensive. This puts their safety at significant risk. In some countries, I believe uh, the workplace safety councils endorse stop working policies during adverse weather to protect workers. However, in Singapore, platforms do not adhere to this safety measure, comprising, compromising rider safety. We call for the abolition of incentive payout tied to this matrix. Moreover, with the cost of living continuing to rise in Singapore, delivery fees paid to riders are decreasing. This shortfall forced riders to work longer hours just to make ends meet, as liberating their financial and physical stress. We demand a fair adjustment of delivery fee to reflect the rising cost of living and ensure riders can earn a decent livelihood. Despite platform operators declaring a loss in their annual reports. The stakeholders are receiving an enormous bonus that would not be possible without the riders logging out for them. This unfair distribution of earnings highlights the need for more compensation and recognition for the rider who form the backbones of this company. Another pressing issue is the delivery of heavy load. Riders are free frequently asked to transport heavy packages, which poses safety hazard or risk. Grab initially pivoted an assistant rider option for heavy load orders, but it was always rejected by the automated chatbot, leaving riders with no choice but to handle the burdensome deliveries alone. Additionally, Food Panda penalized riders who often request for an assistant rider to balance out the heavy load. We advocate for a system whereby heavy loads are delivered by multiple riders distributing the weight more evenly and reducing the physical burden on any one individual. This approach will enhance safety and ensure riders are not overburdened. Moreover, we must question if insurers will honour the claim due due to exceeding safe weight limits or adverse weather condition, which they often classify as an act of God. <laughs> Furthermore, Grab offers two types of insurance for riders. One that covers them while on the job, and one that provides uh, 24 hours coverage. However, both types of insurance are very difficult to claim. Additionally, insurance coverage it's still based on the rider's status within the company, which is an un unfair practice. This issue leaves many riders unprotected and unsupported in terms of need. We call for more accessibility and transparent insurance policy that truly benefit the riders they are supposed to protect. Additionally, we are calling for the automatic inclusion of compensation for long waiting time at Aaron vendors to be added to our fares. 
Riders often face delay at certain vendors, which affects their earnings and efficiency. This compensation would ensure that riders are fairly paid for their time, recognizing the impact of this delay on their overall income. Our campaign for safety improvement is crucial. Everyday riders risk their life on the road, facing traffic and adverse weather conditions. We demand better safety measures, including more protective gear, stricter enforcement of traffic reg regulation to protect riders. No one shall have to choose between their safety and their livelihood. We stand in solidarity with various workers' groups, including migrant workers who often face the harshest condition. Till today, while Singaporeans are not allowed to, but only low-wage migrant workers are ferried uh, on the back of a good, good lorries. Many have died in an accident as, as a result of that. We try to spread awareness among fellow riders about our migrant workers by passing decals on their, by pasting decals on their delivery bags. Our advocacy goes beyond our immediate communi community because we understand that any injury to one is an injury to all. As we fight for better working conditions for food delivery riders, we are also fighting for the janitors, construction workers, and all the hardworking people who keep our city running. This includes advocating for fair treatment across all professions, ensuring that every worker is treated with respect and dignity. In conclusion, our fight for improved safety, wages, and bargaining power is a fight for justice and dignity for all workers. We env envision a world where every worker, regardless of their job, is treated with respect and fairness. As we gather at this conference, let us remember that our struggle is interconnected with the broader fight for environmental and social justice. Uh, finally, as a mark of respect for all workers who have died while on their job, let us observe a moment of silence. Okay, thank you. To together, we can create a sustainable and equitable future for everyone. Thank you. Okay, so finally, we've got Cody Jensen, who's um, a union organizer um, uh, for um, railway workers, I believe. No, construction, I beg your pardon. Uh, but you have worked in the industry in both northern um, uh, sorry the northern um, areas and the Pilbara is that correct okay no worries so Cody so just want to start by acknowledging that we met in our stolen Wajak Noongar country uh, land that was never ceded um, always was, always will be Aboriginal land and the CFMEU and the Social Alliance stand in solidarity with these people until they get justice. Um, just want to in introduce myself. My name's Cody Jensen. I'm an organiser of the CFMEU. The CFMEU stands for the Construction, Forestry, Maritime Employees Union. We are the union for construction workers, the union for textile manufactured workers, union for council workers. We are the union for maritime workers. So we have a large uh, and a very broad um, amalgamations, you know. So... Uh, my job as an organiser is um, to work in Metronet, which is a large railway development happening here in Perth. Um, so Perth's a very long city, if you haven't been here before. Uh, it's 150 kilometres long, and our railways haven't been keeping up with the, uh, the urban sprawl. So the government um, has gone 50-50 uh, with the federal government to you know, fund these projects. And there's, uh, there's railways getting built north up to Yanship, uh, northeast out to um, Ellenbrook. Um, there's a new train station getting built in Midland. Uh, the, the line from Perth to Armidale has been upgraded to reduce um, issues with uh, traffic congestion because there's lots of um, uh, level crossings that have been now the railway has been lifted. Um, and, and the line's been extended out to Byford as well, which is a, a very, very large suburb out in the hills. Um, <coughs> sorry, I'll my speech. 
Uh, also, with myself, um, as I was alluded to, I've got a background as a rail worker. So I'm from Kalgoorlie originally. Kalgoorlie's uh, in the middle of the great western woodlands. Um, it's on the edge of the desert. You know, I spent a lot of time when I was younger um, up in Leonora, which is desert country. Uh, um, I was always a rail worker. You only got two choices in Kalgoorlie, even on the railways or in the mines. So I chose to go on the railways. Uh, I ended up in the Nullarbor. So if you don't know, if you don't know Australia very well, the Nullarbor is a desert in between here and Melbourne and Sydney. Um, it's very flat. The kilometre out there is uh, world famous because it's 150 kilometres in a dead straight line. <laughs> There's no point putting a curve in there. Um, so I used to work out there when I was uh, 18, 19, 20. Um, and so I'd go away for 19 weeks at a time. I learned how to cook out there, uh, take my own food with me. <laughs> and uh, But it's a good experience. Um, then after that, I went to the Pilbara for about nine years. Um, I was up there for the first four years doing construction, so I did four weeks on, one week off, um, building railways for the, the iron ore giants. Um, some were doing extensions. Uh, one was just built um, brand new um, as new companies also wanted to you know, get stuck into the iron ore boom. Uh, so with Metronet, um, it's it's basically called civil construction, and the CFMU has always like uh, been had a strong presence in commercial construction, which is like high-rise buildings. So if you're going around Perth and any other city in Australia, a lot of construction happening at the moment, and um, we've got a very strong history and a storied history of being part of that. Um, but with civil construction in WA, uh, it's basically been a free-for-all. There's been no EBAs, which is the uh, collective bargaining agreements we have in Australia, or the CA, same as Malaysia. Um, it's just common law contracts or casualisation. And it's gone, we've got, after the last 11 years of the uh, Liberal government, got even worse. So when this Metronet come around, the union was our union was pretty quick to jump onto it and say, look, we want agreements for the workers. We want to have proper wages. And on top of the wages, we want proper redundancies. And if they get injured at work, we want proper uh, insurances. That's all part of the collective agreement. Um, and we managed to do that. So it was the first time ever um, in this, this state where that's happened. And we're very proud of ourselves for that. Um, but it doesn't end there. You still have to organise these workers. So it, everyone in CFM, you knows our history. We're, we're a union known for being militant and uh, you know being hard-nosed and um, not forgiving people that do the wrong thing by workers. Uh, so, for example, in 1998, we had the Patrick's Waterfront dispute. So here in Perth, so the, a bit of a prelude to that, the Liberal government said, um, we're going to go after the strongest unions, try and break them. And at the time, there was the MUA. They had a, a strong stranglehold on all the ports, which I think is good. And um, <laughs> and uh, basically, they sacked every every stevedore in, in Australia and bring in these uh, uh, people from um, the army, ex-army people um, that are trained in Dubai. And all of a sudden, in all these ports around Australia, these people in balaclavas took over the ports. And people thought, this is ridiculous, what's going on? Um, so the MUA and the ACTU, which is the, the peak union body in Australia, they, um, they made the decision to fight this um, very publicly. And picket lines are set up in all the ports around Australia. So in every, every city, um, workers just got out there and made sure the scabs couldn't get in. Um, here in Perth, uh, MUA picket line was supplemented by thousands, well, probably hundreds of our CFMU workers. Um, there's a comrade here today that was 18 at the time. He told me a story about his job was to uh, turn sausages on the barbecue for the people on the picket line <laughs> uh, in Melbourne. Um, so this waterfront dispute went for nearly eight months, nine months. Um, in Melbourne, uh, as the police were trying to break the picket lines one night towards the end of the dispute, um, 2,000 Victorian police assembled to break the picket lines um, in the middle of the night and approached the picket lines and we're, we're going to go on and break them. The CFB knowing this, um, and with a big construction job called the Bolt Bridge getting built, 3,000 construction workers from the CFB marched off, um, surrounded the police on three sides. <laughs> and after, uh, after a very st tense standoff, the police realised they were fucked and they, and, uh, th they negotiated their way out. Um, through CFMU lines. Um, now, this is a this is a great he history to tell people, but the uh, people in civil construction, uh, you know, they don't they don't have this history, and we have to create the history for them. We have to have these battles where we um, convince them that first of all they need to be in the union because it's beneficial. But once in the Indian union, we have to organise them to take action. We need delegates. We need HSRs, uh, health and safety reps. Sorry, um, and we need to build power. We need to get them better as collective uh, bargaining agreements. And we just have to make it happen. And that 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 past that we're so proud of the f in the CFMU, we need to build the future in this new construction industry, like uh, for civil works. 
Um, and that leads me to traffic controllers. So if anyone's been around the cities, you've seen the traffic controllers on the lollipops making sure if there's a construction site or some sort of works going on the road, um, you don't just drive your car into them and accidentally kill all the workers. Um, they make sure you slow down or go around or take a detour. Now, it's very dangerous work. So there's been 25 um, traffic controllers killed in the last maybe 10 years. Um, they swore at every day, people tell them to go fuck off and all that kind of stuff. And it's a horrible job. Also, the construction, uh, the traffic control positions are usually the entry for people into the construction industry, especially for a lot of women. And, uh, you know, as a, we want to diversify all our workforces, but if the first six months of their traffic control job, they, their friend gets run over and their, their bosses are cruel to them. They get, they get shit money. Um, they're not going to stick around. Um, and we need to change that. So in Western Australia, there was a company called uh, ATM, Australian Traffic Management, um, and they went, to, went, went through two mass sackings uh, via text message. Um, so the hundreds of workers just told by text, uh, at the end of your shift today, make sure you finish your shift, bring your car back to the yard, and, um, and uh, off you go. Catch you later. Um, don't have a job anymore. So uh, the secretary of my union, um, Mick Buchan, uh, Western Australian secretary, and our legal team, they went to the Fair Work Commission about this. And they said, this is bullshit. Um, they're paid wrong. Um, the Traffic Control Association created their own award called the Miscellaneous Award, which basically means traffic controllers would only get paid um, basically minimum wage with no penalty rates for overtime, uh, no night shift allowance. So, so our battle on the Fair Work Commission was to get the money um, up to the construction award. So if you don't know the award system in Australia, basically there's the NES, the National Employment Standards. Now that's absolute bare bones minimum. You can treat your workers right. And the next step up is the award. And that's the bare bones minimum you can um, pay them for that particular job to do. So they might be a clerical award, construction award, you know, et cetera. Um, and then there's an EBA, which is probably the best you can get if you've got a good union, it looks after you. And the, your workers are strong and organised. Um, and... We went to them and said, look, they're construction workers, they need a white card. And if you don't know, a white card's a basically like a, like a construction induction card that you need to work anywhere in Australia. Um, they wear work boots, they wear high-vis uniforms, they wear hard hats. That sounds like a construction worker to us, and, uh, and which we won, uh, which we're very happy with. So a lot of those workers are going to get a 25% pay increase um, on the 1st of July this year. Um, on top of that, they're going to get uh, shift penalties. So if they do overtime, they get time and a half and double time. If they do night shift, they get uh, 130% of what they usually would. Um, so 30% night shift allowance. Um, they also get ready fund, which is a portable redundancy. So if you work for multiple employers over your 10 years, um, you might work for three different ones. That redundancy goes with you. Um, and then when you finally get made redundant, you can um, you get the choice to take that money and use it, you know, that you've saved up. Also, there's a portable long service scheme called My Leave we have in Western Australia, um, and have, uh, as those people move from company to company and they save up that uh, redundant uh, that that long service leave, it doesn't matter if they leave and they start at a different company, that leave follows with them, so they get all that as well. So they, no matter where they go, they still get that long service leave after you know eight to ten years. Um, but for me, that's not enough. I feel like we still need to organise these workers. There's hundreds of them around the country. Um, and the eastern states have been doing a good job of organising them. Um, and I want to follow suit with that. So once this uh, new award kicks in for them, I want to go start speaking to them all. I want them to do an, join the union to start with and then talk about doing an agreement. Because there's still stuff there... Um, their companies are getting away with they when they go to the mor when they go to their yard in the morning they have to load up the, you know all the signs and stuff in the ute they're doing that for free and when they travel they travel in normal time so if they do 10 hours on site um, the next two hours say if they've got an hour drive home that should be on double time but uh, because it's travel time it goes back to being single time which is you know the normal rate and then a lot of people have an agreement where they only actually get 15 minutes each way so they might get 45 minutes unpaid anyway so if we do an agreement with these workers uh, you know, that'll all be paid, it'll be fully penalties. All those little gaps that get missed in the award, um, we can fill those in with our proper agreement. Um, so that's the mission. Uh, I don't want to give too much away about what our tactics will be, but it's, it's, uh, but it is different, it, it is different um, from our normal structure on, on construction sites where we have like a delegate structure and a, a, a health and safety committee. We have to follow the um, something similar to what the uh, air traffic uh, air traffic maintenance workers in um, South American states use, and the TWU here, the Transport Workers Union, where the, the workers are so spread out, um, 
it's called arbolitos, which means little trees. And um, it's basically about creating small workers' networks. So that'll be our, and hopefully next year, next year's conference, I'll be able to give a positive report about that. Um, also want to give um, Organising Works a plug. So I'm a trainee at the moment, or trainee organiser. The program um, I'm on is called Organising Works and it's run through the ACTU and the CFMU sponsors me through that program. Now the reason this is important is um, there's obviously a um, decline in most countries' union membership and the reason is because neoliberalism is winning and that's what we're all here to talk about. <laughs> and uh, and the, worst, the worst example of that is the United States. Workers' rights have come... You know, it's an absolute disaster over there, and there's no other way of saying it. So in, 19, in the early 1990s, the ACTU sent a delegation to the states because they didn't want to go to, say, Norway, Norway and those countries where things for unions aren't that bad. They want to go see the end result where it just absolutely goes to shit, and that's the United States. So they went over there, and they just um, you know, observed the wreckage that is their labour laws, um, and they, they found a program that Americans are running called Organising Works. And it's about getting people that are delegates or grassroots activists or even just rank and file members that just want to have a crack. They're not just um, happy with just being like a, a member. They don't want to actually have a go. And they put them through a program that structures and, you know, gives structure to that you know, energy they have. And the end result is um, an organiser comes out the other end. And now this is important because um, it's not – I'm a union organiser, but my same schools transfer the climate act in organising – um, and any other organising you can think of, it's all the same thing. It's all about putting the ask on people, having powerful conversations. Because a powerful conversation will make someone join the union. It'll also make them maybe join your First Nations campaigning. It will make them join Dis Bar uh, Disrupt Borough Pub. It will make them join your you know, climate campaign. So a powerful campaign, a uh, powerful speech, and a powerful conversation with someone that connects with them, that'll get them on board, and that's how you build a movement. Individual, individual conversations or conversations with a whole um, you know, room of people like this, if it's powerful, if it connects, um, you know, it'll, be, it'll be effective. And that's, that's how we change the uh, decline in membership, in uh, union membership here in Australia, and it's how we fix a lot of other issues around campaigning. So I'll do a shameless plug. If you want to be a union organiser, please apply for OrgWorks online on the ACTU website. Um, being a unionist is about putting an ask on people. If you're not a member of the union, join your union. If you want to know what it is um, and you don't know yet, go to australianunions.com.au. Go on there. It'll tell you what your union is. Even if you are a uni student, there is a union for you. Even if you're unemployed, there's a union for you. We have to get everyone in because it's all about solidarity. Um, you know, we all have these Marxist values, but we have to put them in the action. Theories are not enough. Um, also... Uh, putting the ask on people, please subscribe to the Green Left. It makes a huge difference. <laughs> and um, also, please welcome my comrades from, um, you know, the, from Singapore and Malaysia. It's such an amazing trip they've done to come here. And if I can go to another country one day and speak a different language and talk about being in the CFMU over there, I'll be, I'll be very proud of my career. Um, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> Can I just say also that um, I'm a job rep for the Australian Nurses and Midwifery Union in Victoria and we've just come and won a massive um, EBA for the next four years and we're very, very happy with that. But I just want to say I'm very lucky and um, I'm listening to our colleagues here from Malaysia and Singapore and I'm thinking, what can we do to help? And... Um, Keep fighting the good fight. Um, so when thinking about like growing union movements um, and, you know, solidarity and having more militant unions, something that I feel like I keep seeing when I'm looking into these issues and like how we used to in Australia have massive union membership a few decades ago, it feels like... There's also a legal landscape in the way that, and also the way that unions are structured that makes it harder for them to actually want to rock the boat and do anything. So how do we change that landscape so that we can get more militant unions like the CFME EU? The, I think that what we saw with the Malaysian comrade, we saw that decline of unionism um, in Malaysia, we've got a very similar decline of unionism in, in Australia. 
And it all, a lot of it comes from that whole neoliberal agenda where to bring their agenda in, they had to basically crush uh, or stop the unions or, or reduce the power of the unions. And this is obviously a worldwide thing. I think we've all known that. But to see that graph, it was so similar to the demise of the Australian uh, union movement as well. And um, <coughs> when they bought in, they bought in the same privatisation in Australia as what they did on that Malaysian graph as well. And so what we've seen now is a development of uh, cartel capitalism with the privatisation of all these very necessary, um, what were in public hands, utilities, um, and obviously Malaysia's gone down the same path. So that was very interesting, I found. And I'm a union organiser as well with the RNW in Melbourne. And um, <clears throat> what we're seeing too now, which is a problem, is that we are getting privileged layers of workers who are still covered by enterprise agreements and on very good wages in comparison to the majority of workers who are now on award wages. And the, compa and the difference is phenomenal. 15 bucks an hour, it can be. And this is something that is becoming a very worrying trend because it's also helping to lead to the conservatism of the privileged union members, and a lot of them I cover. And the CFMU is often in the same boat. And yet what we're also seeing is this development of the poor working class who are on award wages, who now can't, are finding it almost impossible to meet their mortgage repayments. And so now they're going without food and heating. And this is a big thing that's happening in Melbourne right now. And so what we need to work out is how this thing is going to turn around. Because the problem with the unions, it's the privileged EBA workers who pay the dues. And if the union doesn't look after those workers, then in turn the union implodes. But there's not enough leadership coming from the unions, but there's also not enough pressure coming from the working class. So we're in this malaise at this point in time, and it's not improving at the moment. So what I'm going to ask of the comrades from overseas, is there a problem with privileged workers inside your unions who are still getting far better wages than the majority of people? And is that, in a sense, also helping to hold the, union, the unions back? Uh, thank you very much um, for your speeches. My question... Uh, relates to yeah the fear and racism about migrant workers and how each of your uh, unions, organisations, parties uh, uh, advocate for migrant workers to be allowed to be part of unions. Um, I think the first question was about like what are the unions going to do to reverse the um, like the density and why we can't be more militant. So a lot of the problem is the laws that surround like strike action. So at the moment you can only take strike action if you're at the end of an, like a EBA, like a bargaining agreement. So if you take strike outside of that, you incur massive fines, not just for the union itself, and uh, but also for the members or just the workers that participate. Um, so the reason you know people are scared to go on strike is because you don't have a right to strike unless it's three months either side of your EBA expiring. So um, the unions don't want to incur these giant million dollar fines because you know we. We um, take the dues off our members and we want to spell on, spend that money on stuff like employing organisers and doing stuff that helps them. We don't just you don't spend that money. Their money is paying fines that we incur. Um, you know, in the in the last nine years of the Liberal government, the Western Australian branch has from you incurred fourteen million dollars in fines. Um, and you know how that's not something that's sustainable. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> um, but we. And, the, and because we keep, because we just pay the fines when we get them, they just put they just keep putting the fines up higher. So every time we um, get fined, the, the fines higher again. They just change the laws for us because the CFMU just keeps paying them. Um, so we need to change the laws, and uh, we need our right to strike back because there's lots of issues. You know, when I got a job sites, and if I was just like, you know what, everyone fuck this, let's walk out, and uh, we'll make sure no one else gets to work here until the uh, uh, issues are sorted. Um, you know, that would fix a lot of issues overnight. Uh, but we don't have that, don't have that right. And I think if, I kind of see my future as being um, a campaigner 
where we lobby the government to, you know, get a right the strike back, a real right the strike. Um, otherwise, we just don't go anywhere but down, and you know, eventually there won't be a union movement. I think um, if we don't get that right the strike back. For Comrade Alex, uh, questions? Alex, right? His name is Alex, right? Ah. Oh, Nick. Oh, sorry. So, uh, actually, our hospital union all is... Uh, uh, we, we, we actually categorize the workers as a B40. It means, uh, means uh, people. B40, T20. means B40 is uh, it's around 40%. Below uh, means uh, they are more... Uh, the wages is uh, below 3,000. So we ca categorize as a B40. So our hospital union is uh, more for the cleaners and security. The basic is uh, 1,500 only. So our union is fight for this kind of workers. So, but other union like us, uh, we have unions for like uh, Bank bank workers staff, so they are more like a, a more higher salary, but we are party. Our, our party is more like we are going to the gr grassroots people, and we are fighting for them. So I think I already uh, answered, and also for the migrant. Yeah, the uh, can you uh, the comrade asking about the migrant? Yeah. Uh, what? Actually, we are like our hospi uh, hospital union, we are trying to organize migrant workers. But the thing is, uh, the uh, agent that bring the migrant workers to Malaysia, they are like uh, 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 create a fear for them. So they cannot join the union. If they say they join the union, they will uh, send back them to their original country. They will take the passport, the permit. So actually, our hospital unit trying. We we were trying to organize the migrant worker, but we have still one or two members. We still have. So we have. Uh, we trying to communicate with them, but the fear is uh, there. So it's a uh, also a big challenge for us to organize migrant workers. Uh, just uh, just a point. I think in terms of the presentation, if you look at the, I think the entire the the. Um, composition of the working class is changing and this is a phenomenon across the globe now and it is of course you know the co the consequence of say capitalism being in crisis so you know obviously it's the working class it's the workers that are hit the most i think the may way in which it's changing across the globe obviously has a very national character to it so for instance i would say australia if you you can't even compare minimum wages i know from my visit here last year that the minimum wage over here is probably 50 dollars an hour that's around 3,000 Indian rupees an hour, which is probably just, you know, twice of it is what the minimum wage somebody earns over there for an entire month. So I think it's very different. Really, you can't get into that. But the point is that the way in which the, the working class character is changing, the composition is changing of workers, let alone the working class itself. I think how does one, you know, really factor that into our own, you know, our own uh, trade union ways. So for instance, you know, what uh, both comrades were saying, the unorganized workers. It's very interesting. It's actually, one can also say that these are consciously disorganized workers. That you've created a workforce, you've created a, a, a kind of a industry where organizing becomes the most difficult part. So for instance, gig workers, you're not even a worker. You're supposedly a partner. Yeah, I mean, it's like so bizarre. I think in Australia, there's an entire battle, legal battle that was fought for Uber, where they finally got declared that, okay, this, this entire thing is a complete sham. This is, so I think there are many, these kinds of subterfuges, many kinds of oppressive methods that are coming in, which are making organizing a very, very difficult task. So that dip that you're seeing, the dip is for many, many reasons. And I think this is one. The second thing, which I just like some kind of reflection, uh, you know, some kind of thought on it, this, this, this really, the um, economic deprivation that is caused by this kind of um, this kind of uh, labor policies, economic policies, neoliberalism, as you say, it's also giving rise to serious disgruntlement within the workers. 
and a big waste that actually becomes fuel for even far right kind of regimes like the us for instance mm -hmm. which is the biggest uh, support base say that uh, the trump has and it, it's really shocking then when you when you make those connections so when you talk about even say migrant workers so probably the most anger that would come out against migrant workers like in our in our country migration is interstate most of the anger that you will find sometimes is from the workers who are themselves contractualized themselves on lesser than minimum wages really you know at the mercy of their employers but they are the ones who be most angry that some other really poor person has come from another northern state to take the jobs away so you know it, that's the kind of you know also uh, i think the uh, complication that we see so how would you know you, you see that happening say for instance in malaysia singapore and even in australia yeah, thanks hi thank you very much uh, for all this uh, great information we have just what i want to clarify like what you call it migrant worker we call them like international worker with temporary visa or we can call them foreign worker, like what they call them in Middle East. They are, they are not a migrant because a migrant means they are in the process to be citizens. That's what I clarified. Here in Australia, we have around 25,000 refugees with temporary visa. We've been asking the government to give them the right to work. And what happened is like, this, I know some of Iraqi, they, uh, they are in Australia for more than six years, I then don't have the right to work. And that's give us the, give me the question for you, like, what do you think about what we call it when the worker go and beg for work? And he said, okay, if you give Khaled $10, give me $7, but because he's like in legally work, uh, is this something union can help in it? Because it's make like some fights between worker because like, yeah, you are taking my position. Why you are going for this low wages? And I don't know, like this problem I'm facing a lot in Middle East in background people, especially in security and hospitality. Uh, I don't know, just I want uh, your help to answer this question. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll just go one round for final remarks from our speakers, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Okay. Would you like to start first? Oh, Peter, you didn't speak before? Are you? <laughs> uh, with, with Australia in particular, like the, the laws are designed to um, exploit migrant workers and international workers and there's no other way of putting it because um so if people come here on like a working visa uh, in australia you have to do a certain amount of um days in the city then you have to do a certain amount of days in the bush <coughs> excuse me um so and they don't mind what the money that what money they're on they just want to complete that visa so they can stay in australia if that's if that's their goal um so and what will happen is you'll find people portraying their own countrymen so you will have, uh, speaking from personal experience, to be like Afghans exploiting Afghan tilers, and they're on a you know on their own construction site because they can speak the language, and they've got the the cultural background, and that's what they'll do. They they exploit their own countrymen, and it happens here with the Irish, and it happens with the the Chinese as well. So and I don't speak Mandarin, so I can't go. Oh hey mate, can I see your pace it to make sure you're not getting ripped off? You know it's it's hard it's hard to organise around that. You know maybe I should learn a different language, but um, and even uh, my ex partner actually comes from Malaysia and um. She was here on a uh, student visa. So, and to do her course here in Australia, it was $1,000 a month, but you're only allowed to work 20 hours a week. Um, and then, so you're already, so you're already starting off with a $1,000 a month uh, payment that you gotta pay. And out of that $20 a week, um, oh, sorry, 20 hours a week, you're allowed to work. Uh, you know, you gotta pay for fuel, you gotta get a car, you gotta find somewhere to live, and also you gotta pay, pay for your uni or whatever, you know, whatever you're studying. So you're in a situation where you either have to find a high paying job for 20 hours a week, or you have to work uh, like cash jobs or something like that, or something else is exploitative. So the whole system's designed to um, fuck migrants over, basically. And um, you know, it's, it, Australia's happy to do that, and that's, that's, that's half the problem. So the laws need to change around that, and needs more uh, needs to be more 
advocacy around that as well. So I think um, I think the union's trying to push for people that come into Australia to be auto- automatically made union members with an opt out. So you know you're not you're not trapped into your union membership, but you automatically are. And someone sits down and explains to you that these are the Australian laws. Um, and if someone tries to make you do something else from that, you need to ring your union because we can sort that out. Um, and the Sydney, uh, sorry, the New South Wales Trade Tools done an excellent job of um, starting this thing called VisaLink. So they'll go and find migrant workers that have uh, obviously been exported, they might be like, um, like sex workers and stuff. Um, and they'll put them in, in someone that knows visa laws. So the boss can't say, um, oh, well, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to get rid of your visa because I, I control your visa situation and you get sent home. Um, and that's that's the situation here in Australia. So it need to be it needs to be separated where um, workers uh, migrant workers are a bit more protected. So um, if they just say no to the boss, the boss can't just snap their fingers and cancel their visa. Because once the visa is cancelled, um, uh, industrial laws don't apply to that worker anymore. So so even if I know, I know about it as a unionist, I can't do nothing about it because those laws don't even apply. They're just going to go home, be gone forever, and you know it can't be fixed. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, and I think that's it. Okay, Dana or Peter, did you have anything? Okay, uh, actually, uh, the situation in Malaysia, uh, we can, I guess the migrant workers' uh, uh, numbers is increasing. And they are more uh, focusing in manufacturing and construction uh, jobs. But the thing is, like uh, Comrade Clifton said, all are... No matter which country, which race they are coming from, all is a working class. But the thing is, when it's come to Malaysia, there's a dis- discrimination. So the Malaysian worker thought the migrant workers is uh, uh, what they are like stealing their all the benefit. So they feel like a threat. The migrant workers is threat for them, and it's a very hard to unite all of them as a working class. So we have that, that kind of challenge. Even though uh, PSM, we are trying to organize uh, uh, migrant workers, we have, just now I said the fear, the fear among the workers and also uh, their insecurity. So the permit they will take away and they will deport. So this thing, uh, that, that's why PSM is, uh, we are working together with R2R, the another, uh, another uh, team, group, so we are trying, uh, and also in PSM we have a migrant worker bureau. So I think uh, if anyone uh, knows Comrade Rani, so she is handling that bureau. So we are trying to uh, unite, but uh, it still uh, become a <laughs> a big challenge because uh, even in local I means in Malaysian worker also we have a race. We have a Malays, Chinese, Indian. Even the even the Malaysian workers not unite un, united, so we have that racist. We have the racist issue issue. So we have a, we, we have a handle with. We have to deal with the Malaysian worker who is not. Uh, they are breaking into uh, race race, and also with migrant workers. We we have a big picture here. So it's hard as a but. Of course, I say as I said the union. Uh, the I think hospital unions is the uh, the union uh, which uh, union is like uh, do a lot of protests. No, no, no other union. So uh, actually, uh, hospital unions is a national union. So we are uh, like uh, always we will go to protest. So other unions like they are keep silent. They are not very active. So this also like. Uh, uh, the the union not very active actually in Malaysia. Okay, so um, can we please thank our three speakers again? <laughs> just a re- just a reminder that the afternoon session will be starting at two o'clock. So gulp down your lunch really quickly. <laughs> okay, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>